engineers, we all know the importance of turning it up to 11, right? It's for those situations when 10 just isn't enough. When you really need to go for it. If you design with FPGAs, you're already turning it up to 11 on a regular basis. FPGAs deliver spectacular performance, crazy fast time to market, and even full 11 in flexibility. So, why the heck would you want to use just plain old DDR3? I mean, that's like turning your memory performance up to like, you know, 6 or something. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk, and if you're serious about performance in your FPGA-based design, you need something faster than DDR3, right? Like, how about DDR4? My guest today is Ahab Mosin from Xilinx, and we're going to talk about DDR4 support in Xilinx's newest FPGAs. Before we get started, remember to click the link. There you can download a free white paper that further expands on this topic. Hi, Ahab. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. It's good being here. Okay, so I'm excited. We've talked a lot about DDR3 in previous Chalk Talks, but this is my first time conquering DDR4. So why are we leveling up here, Ahab? Well, we know that a lot, if not most, FPGA systems need some kind of external memory interface to buffer data. But working with external memories is one of the more challenging aspects of FPGA design when you're trying to interface to the outside world. And because DDR4 is the latest parallel memory technology to support these next generation bandwidth applications, we'd like to focus on that today. Okay, which brings us to why DDR4? Well, first of all, DDR3 is really the most dominant memory used today in FPGA designs. So the question is, why to migrate to the next generation? The most obvious advantage is the faster data rates, and hence more bandwidth per FPGA pin. Secondly, DDR4 is running at a lower operating voltage, so you'll get greater power efficiency. And naturally, as you move to next generation memories, you'll typically get more density, meaning more memory capacity per unit area on the board. This chart shows an estimated adoption rate. As you can see, 2014 and 15 represent early adoption picking up as we move through 2016. As of 2014, first-tier manufacturers have started manufacturing DDR4, with early adopters typically being in the server application market. Okay, Hab, but what's the big deal? Why do we have to keep migrating to faster and faster memories? Well, as long as FPGAs continue to support higher bandwidth applications from generation to generation, that means more throughput coming on and off the chip through I.O. and particularly transceivers and it means more complex processing taking place in the chip. This demands that memory buffering capabilities keep up. For example, when data is being transformed, whether it be in the form of pixel correction or Ethernet packet processing, or maybe more processing engines within the FPGA need to touch the same data, the FPGA will need more time to perform this. The longer the data needs to be stored, the deeper the external memory buffer needs to be, and the faster the interface has to be in order to read and write back data fast enough to keep up with the traffic. So this can be a design challenge since the number of FPGA pins is limited by the device package size. And that means data rates and bandwidth per pin need to increase with each generation. And more care needs to be taken to designing the interface to meet timing margin. And as we all know, as performance increases, so does switching activity and power dissipation across the IOs. Designers have to reconcile this performance increase when meeting power budgets. Okay, Hab, what do you see as the key challenges we face doing memory interfaces? Well, when you're selecting an FPGA to interface to memories, there are several things you have to keep in mind in terms of the interface support. First is the ability to maximize total effective bandwidth. And this is more than just supporting the specs line rates, which we'll talk about more in a minute. Second, as we mentioned, you still have to curb power dissipation in order to meet power budgets. And third, of course, you want to ensure the lowest total cost solution. This naturally refers to the memory components, but of course the FPGA itself. Okay, so on your first point, when you say maximizing bandwidth, now isn't that just basically the memory interface line rate times the number of pins on the FPGA? Well, yeah, the first thing you'll probably look at is the line rate support. How fast can each FPGA pin toggle to transfer the most information? This is determined by the memory protocol and whether the FPGA can support it. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. 
Yeah, it is, but it gets more complicated than that. The second factor is the number of interfaces that can be supported. Designs may have very complex schemes, talking to multiple memories of various bus widths. Experienced designers know that FPGAs tend to have rules around I.O. pin usage and bank usage. So an important factor is how flexible is the I.O. architecture to maximize the number of interfaces that can be used of varying bus widths. And the next consideration is bandwidth efficiency. Memories themselves have read and write limitations. For example, how often and frequently can you touch a specific memory cell in the memory after you've read or written to it? A memory bus may spend a good portion of its time idle because of things like this. A sophisticated memory controller can counteract some of these limitations. So really, total effective FPGA memory bandwidth depends on all of these things. With our 20 nanometer and 16 nanometer ultrascale FPGAs, we've carefully addressed these factors to maximize DDR4 bandwidth, which we'll be discussing. We'll first talk about the hardened physical layer, or PHY, along with the I.O. architecture of the FPGA, and how they're enabled to not only support DDR4 line rates, but provide robustness. We'll also talk about the PHY's flexibility and how it's optimized to maximize the number of interfaces with extremely wide or narrow buses. Then we'll talk about the soft memory controller that is situated in the programmable logic fabric of the FPGA and how it provides various features to improve data bus efficiency. Okay, Ab, can you elaborate on each of these for me? Sure. So firstly, we achieve optimal performance and robustness through an advanced PHY and I.O. architecture. The PHY within the FPGA generates the signal timing and sequencing required to interface to the memory. Now because timing is so critical for these paths, the memory PHY in ultrascale FPGAs is hardened, making it capable of low latency transfer of data, address, command and clock signals to and from the FPGA fabric and IOs. Naturally, the PHY supports the DDR4 spec, with our 20 nanometer FPGA supporting 2400 megabits per second, and the 16 nanometer solution supporting up to 2666. The clocking module and PLLs within the PHY block provide fine delay capabilities of down to 5 picoseconds that allow fine tuning of the clock to data alignment. This enables real-time calibration with very fine resolution, which is essential at speeds like 2400. But you mentioned robustness. Now, what exactly do you mean by that? Well, a robust memory interface solution must do more than meet the DDR4 spec by supporting simple I.O. switching under really ideal conditions. Critical to the solution is timing margin under realistic conditions while transmitting complex data patterns. Such conditions may include voltage and temperature variation. The FPJ technology is critical in making this possible, so we did several things. The PHY uses isolated power supplies to ensure that jitter is minimized for the best timing margin. And the PHY features built-in self-calibration against process, voltage, and temperature variation with real-time voltage and temperature tracking during live data. In fact, because we're at such high data rates, we're adopting capabilities that you'd ordinarily just see in transceiver technology, like preemphasis and equalization, which are well-understood techniques that compensate for signal distortion at high line rates. So in short, we've architected the interface to make sure you can reach max data rates in real-world application environments. Excellent. That makes sense. But What's this interface flexibility that you're talking about? One would think that you should be able to create any memory interface of any width on any FPGA pin. Well, not exactly. What you'll find in traditional architectures is that if you use an I.O. bank, which is a group of pins, or multiple banks for a memory interface, there may be limitations to using the other pins in the bank for other purposes, whether it be for another memory interface or just regular I.O.s. So a big challenge when designing is how to pack memory interfaces without wasting or leaving pins unused per bank. If I.O. bank selection is coarse, you may run into a pin limitation problem. So we made sure that the architecture is very modular to allow for flexible configurations for high pin use efficiency and ultimately highest effective bandwidth. For each 52-pin I.O. bank, you have four byte-wide or 13-bit FIs along with two dedicated PLLs and a clocking module. The two PLLs per bank allow for two independent interfaces running at different rates within a single bank. An I.O. bank can be split at any byte lane boundary to create another interface or for other usage. For example, two 32-bit interfaces can fit in three I.O. banks as shown as the first example on the right, while a 64-bit interface can fit in two and a half banks but leaving two byte lanes available for other usage. Another major benefit of ultrascale flexibility is support for 4-bit data width memory components, 
And by that, we're referring to the data bus coming from each chip on the DIN. So for a given interface, this allows Ultrascale to support larger form factor DINs that have more memory chips on them for higher capacity. Additionally, the multi-rank capability of the PHY enables four loads on the same address bus. And this means Ultrascale can support two DIM slots, each with memory chips on the front and back of them, increasing the memory depth accessible to the FPGA even further. And when you add it all up, the combination of Ultrascale with DDR4 gives you up to 8x the capacity when compared to 7 series and DDR3 memories. Excellent. Okay, so you've described the physical interface, but everyone knows the other half of a memory solution is the controller. What notable advancements have you made on that front? Well, first of all, for flexibility, it's important to note that the memory controller is in the programmable logic fabric. Okay, so the PHY is hard and the controller is soft, is that right? Yeah, the PHY is hardened to maximize performance and the controller is soft to maximize flexibility. The new controller leverages the bank group feature in the DDR4 protocol to improve data bus efficiency and lower the access latency. The controller also features an optimized command queue structure that strategically reorders commands in groups, reads, and writes for lower bus turnaround. Another notable feature is improved internal clock timing that results in a shorter command to read data latency. And for flexibility, the controller provides users with new options to customize the page management algorithm for maximum bandwidth. Page management options can be set that better suit an application's specific command patterns. Additionally, the controller has the flexibility to connect to an AXI bus, providing an easy interface with other AXI IPs. And AXI is an interconnect standard that makes it easier to plug and play IP, right? Exactly. Also, this can be used to create multi-port memory controllers, where each port is independent and can support different clocks and port widths. Okay, now in the beginning you alluded to power consumption. Now, how does DDR4 and your FPGAs limit power with these higher line rates? I.O. power in particular can be a big chunk of overall FPGA power, can't it? Yes, definitely. In some cases, it can be as much as 50% of overall FPGA power. And memory interfaces can play a big role in that. Fortunately, the new DDR4 device architecture and enhancements made in ultrascale FPGAs do several things to minimize power. First, as we mentioned, DDR4 is based on 1.2 operating voltage versus 1.5 for DDR3. In addition, the standard employs what's called pseudo-open drain termination so that memory cells can store a logical one without consuming power. Also, the interface utilizes a data bus inversion technique that minimizes the number of signals switching and hence minimizes switching power. Now in the table below, two comparisons are made on the second and third row for a 32-bit ultrascale FPGA memory interface solution with DDR4 running at 1866 and 2400 respectively. And we compare this to our previous generation 7 series FPGA running DDR3 at 1866 with all configurations executing 50% reads versus 50% writes. You see at the same data rate you can get 36% lower power with DDR4 on ultrascale and at 30% higher data rates you can still get 15% lower power. Wow, so faster and lower power at the same time? Exactly. A lot to gain from this memory technology. Okay, so how does this all affect cost? You know, some people still care about money. Right. Well, there are a few things an FPGA can do to keep system costs down. First of all, vendors are good at promoting the max performance specs for their silicon. But of course, system designers have to pay attention to what's available and what speed grade. Fortunately, ultrascale FPGAs uniquely provide the 2400 data rate in a mid-speed grade device, providing a more cost-effective device for systems that need full line rate support. Secondly, the efficient I.O. bank utilization that we discussed will translate into the most cost-effective device package. Fewer I.O. banks required per memory interface, finer grain control pins in each bank, and fewer I.O.s required per gigabyte of capacity translates into a cheaper device package. And lastly, we all know that power efficiency translates into lower cooling costs, as we saw in the example. With 30% lower power versus DDR3, this can really add up. Sure. So, Ahab, can you recap for me a bit? Sure. When we built ultrascale FPGAs for DDR4 support, we went beyond just simply supporting the specs line rates. We architected the device to ensure robustness and flexibility to maximize total effective bandwidth, all while minimizing power consumption and ensuring designers can leverage the highest line rates with the most cost-effective devices. Most importantly, designers can start today 
The ultrascale families were the first to demonstrate DDR4 in FPGAs, and devices are shipping now as our evaluation boards. Excellent. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Ahab. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks, Amelia. Thanks for having me. Before we go, don't forget to click that link. There you can download a free white paper that further expands on this topic. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton. For more Chalk Talks, check out the EE Journal YouTube channel or the on-demand section of eejournal.com.